Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to session four of Comply Part One Accessibility for the N2L training series. Um, if anybody has any questions as we go through, please feel free to, um, to put something in the chat. In fact, I will bring the chat up so I can see it. And um, I'll try to, you know, check out any um, um, information as we go through and see if anybody has any questions. Um, a big part of creating online content now is making sure that your content is ADA compliant, which is the American um, Disabilities um, Services. And let me go to this one here. So this whole module deals with making sure that your content is ADA compliant. And we're also going to talk a little bit about using um, universal design. Um, the big thing is, I mean, a lot of times we gear our information towards um, students that might have disabilities at the time or are sight impaired or hearing impaired, things like that. But a lot of the things that we do um, actually help out all of our students, okay? Um, for one of the things like if we have um, a video playing um, having the uh, closed caption showing can help everybody. Um, it helps with the vocabulary so students can actually see the words that are being spoken. So that's just, you know, one experience um, for ADA. So a big part of this module, like I said, is, is removing the barriers for everyone and not just for um, making it ADA compliant, which also helps. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about how the standards that we're going to be looking at through um, Oscar that we've talked about since day one, um, the quality rubric and um, the ADA standards are actually built right into Oscar. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, learning steps to create compliant materials. Um, I am going to talk a little bit too. I don't really have it in my PowerPoint, but um, our responsibility of selecting um, course materials that are um, compliant as well. All right. Um, and like I said, building our des and designing our materials using the um, universal design methods. And um, we're also going to talk about the key takeaways of um, working with um, students that might have, whether it be learning disabilities or other um, types of problems that they have, okay, or issues. All right, um, so Oscar has a whole section on design and layout. And I pulled this into my PowerPoint because just about everything in the design and layout would fall under the accessibility issues. Um, you know, a couple of things they talk about is don't have um, flashing or blinking text. That would be awful. Um, I know that we have some faculty that would have problems with that, with vertigo and, you know, stuff like that. Um, using standard fonts. Um, I mean, I know that we like to spruce our stuff up, but we want to stay towards the sans serif fonts as opposed to the serif fonts um, that usually have curved tags. Um, I know that Suzanne was thrilled when we were allowed to go back and start using Times New Roman again. Um, that back in 2014 was not allowed. So there are a few of the serif fonts that are allowed. Um, displaying your content in a nice, neat layout manner. Again, that's going to help everybody. It's not just for accessibility. Um, making sure that your text contrast is, um, is a nice, I mean, actually this almost is too light, this blue text on the screen here. Um, it should actually be darker text. Um, I would have a tough time reading this. Um, so you want to make sure that your contrasts make sense and are readable. And then they get into talking about doing alt text on um, uh, tables and on um, URLs that you set up and images. And basically the big thing is making sure that when you print out a document without color, does it make sense? Okay. And I've talked to a few people about this when we talked about making your syllabus ADA compliant. Um, using slideshow um, layouts. Very important to make sure you do that because it won't read right if um, if you uh, with the screen readers, if you don't use the layout. So like I said, this whole section in here um, about course design and layout is all built um, as part of the ADA compliance. Okay. 
Then I also grabbed, um, there's a section in the content and activities. And um, one of the, the big things is giving our students the ability to express themselves in different ways. Um, I know that a lot of our student learning outcomes require that maybe a student expresses themselves through writing. Okay, so obviously you have to have more text space, but um, you know, supplying them videos to watch or letting them create a video or you know, show different ways that they can um, present themselves or for you to present the materials. So sometimes just giving them different options and how the materials can be used and watched and learned um, can be part of making it more accessible as well. Okay, um, in this section, I, I highlighted and pointed to the information about making sure you um, give them a PDF. Now does a PDF definitely make it um, accessible? No but it might make it accessible for you know, our students that are using handheld devices. Obviously we wanna to try to make our um, PDFs fully accessible so that they can be read to a student if they're using a screen reader, but just giving them a PDF also helps everybody, okay? So um, that's why it's highly recommended. So if they were pulling up a document on a phone, they could do that. All right, so that's one thing. Um, Another thing they talk about is having alt tags and captions on all of the non-text items, okay? Um, if you have a image of something, you should always have the alt tag on it. So that way if a screen reader read it to them, it would tell them what that picture was of. Um, if you have a video, you wanna make sure that you have transcripts, okay? Um, either a transcript or closed caption. The, the recommended is the closed caption so that as the video is playing, they're actually seeing the text that is being spoken at that moment, okay? So that would be the preferred one. But if you were to have a video that you didn't have the ability to closed caption it, you could um, actually build a transcript for it, which would be probably your script. But now we have tools like YouTube, if you upload a video into YouTube, it automatically closed captions it for you, okay? And it's gotten a lot more accurate than it used to be. Our ensemble has the option to go in and close caption. Um, I think even, um, I know that we, if we have pro accounts, if you take it a uh, Zoom recording, it takes it out to ensemble and it will close caption it. So there are services out there that we really don't need to use transcripts like we used to because we're not paying for the services anymore. Okay. Donna, can I chime in with one sure. question I see in the chat? <clears throat> um, so two things also, I just want to mention that we are on a Zoom right now, that if you go in your settings in Zoom, we've mentioned it before on these weekly meetings, um, you could set it up so a transcript will, when you record to the cloud, it will automatically create a transcript for it. Now, when I send the recordings out right after these sessions, it usually takes a day till the transcript somewhere happens overnight at some point that the transcript shows, but that does make it compliant. So you can make these Zoom recordings if you're using them for your blended class or other things, you can also get a transcript with them. And second is Erica had a question in the chat, but I, I responded, but she wanted to know if there was a font that was um, a best use for those students with dyslexia or uh, you know, she wanted a little more information on what fonts would work. I told her we'll send her a link to um, a list of fonts that work for accessibility. Yeah, I don't know if there's a specific font for that particular issue, um, but the recommended fonts are like Arial, Calibri, yep. um, Times New Roman is allowed, even though in the past it was not allowed. Um, but anything that they say that has like a tag on the end, or if you look like, I mean, obviously you would the real fancy ones that look like they're handwritten are harder to read. And I do have a link somewhere. I don't know if it's on our accessibility resource center but if not i will um i will get it and share it with the group because i know i have a, a, a link to it okay that lists of all the fonts that meet accessibility standards okay all right. all right so um one of the things and i kind of did what you're not supposed to do on the bottom of this slide i actually have the url showing um a screen reader when it hits that would actually read to them https colon and so on so really you should have text describing what you're linking out to and not showing the URL, okay? I did it in case somebody wanted to write it down while they were seeing it on the screen and didn't wanna wait until they had access to the actual PowerPoints to pull that up, okay? 
but we'll so they're already supplied actually at this point. So you could always pull up the PowerPoint and click on that link. All right. So I kind of went against what uh, what we are preaching to the choir here. So the big thing is that if you were to look at a document or a page and any images that are on the page, are they described correctly? Do they have the alt text? Do they have maybe a paragraph below them to describe them? So that's some of the things you want to think about as you're creating your own materials. Okay. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is all the resources that we have available for us that will help you prepare your content and your materials to make sure it's ADA compliant. Okay. All right. Um, one of the other big things that's happening right now is SUNY has set up um, groups for um, every campus, all 64 campuses have a, um, a group that's part of our, what we're doing on our campus for electric, um, electronic and information technology EIT accessibility. And I'm actually on this committee and we just submitted our report. We had a report to SUNY telling them what we were gonna be doing for the next two years to prepare our faculty and staff and our facilities as well. It's not just our electronic parts of it. Um, what are we doing to prepare our campus to make sure it's totally ADA compliant? All right, and that's part of the reason why we did another set of sessions back in October on you know, how to make documents ADA compliant, how to make a PDF that's compliant, things like that. So, um, and that was one of the things that we reported back from our department that said, you know, we're gonna continue to work with our faculty um, through the next two years and try to train them and prepare them for this task that they're gonna have, all right? So not only are we answering to um, uh, basically any uh, service here, we're also answering to SUNY to make sure that we have all of our information um, ADA compliant. Plus we gotta remember that, especially when you think about now that we've gone remote and then come back and then try to build our materials um, after the fact, that we have a lot of stuff to go back and fix that we've you know, uploaded and added to our courses. Um, and if you make your courses totally accessible, it, I shouldn't say there's no way to make it totally accessible, um, to make it as accessible as possible you are not going to have to go back quickly when you get a student that says that they're sight impaired or hearing impaired and try to change your content to make it work for those students. We're trying to do it right from the get-go when we're building it, okay? So that's why we've got it part of the six-week program to make sure that you guys know as you're building what you need to do, okay? Now, we also have a whole section, and this is what Lisa was talking about. Um, we have a section on our blog on our Teaching Academy blog here on accessibility. And um, I just have a small screen capture of it. But on this particular um, part of our website, we also have all of our recordings that we did back in October on how to make a Word document compliant, how to you know, create a PDF that's compliant from a Word document or from a PowerPoint, things like that. So um, I would recommend, you know, if you're not real familiar, going back through and watching those videos to, based on what you're building material-wise. Um, PowerPoints um, that are downloaded from publishers are very often not even close to being ADA compliant. So it's our responsibility to either reach out to the publisher and ask them, you know, you wanna include this in your course? Um, can you give me an ADA compliant version? Um, a lot of them right now are saying that, you know, contact us when you do have a student that is, is blind or sight impaired or um, hearing impaired, um, which at that point, you're already putting that student a week or two behind waiting for those materials to become ADA compliant to use them in your courses. So, um, so we'll talk about some of the things that you can do to work around that as well. Okay, so this is a, one of the great resources for you to use. Okay. Um, another resource that you can use is Blackboard ALI. And that's that gear that you're seeing on your files that you upload in your courses. Okay. And they have um, the technology that will actually tell you what steps or what things are wrong with your documents. And Ally actually goes deeper than Microsoft Word. So if you're already using the checker and Word, 
it's not grabbing everything and Ally is picking up quite a few more things. So you might run that accessibility checker in Word and think you've got it all ready to go and then you upload it into Blackboard and all of a sudden it's telling you that um, there's still some issues with it. So you're, it's actually better to um, upload it to YouTube and I'm sorry, up, up, upload it to Blackboard so Blackboard can check the files. Okay, so, um, you know, use that tool. It's a great tool to use. Okay. All right. So one of the things we're going to talk about is what we're going to be doing in um, module four um, homework wise. And we're going to talk about the, um, the um, activities that I have you doing. And um, I know some of the stuff you've already done but it might just need to be tweaked to make it ADA compliant, okay? Um, I know a lot of you have been sending me your, your syllabus and I've been looking at them um, as requested. Um, and I've been you know, cleaning some of them up and getting them ready for you. So if, um, if you do want some help with that, I, you know, I've been working with this for years now. Um, and I was also trained back in 2014 with Lisa and Lynn Brochu to um, learn how to you know, make the, the documents and stuff compliant. So I can help you out with that as well, okay? Um, okay, so the next steps is I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna bring up the course and um, what we're gonna have you do. So at this point, you should see my Blackboard. So Joanne, you're shaking your head, yeah, so I know you can see it. All right, so, yeah. okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go in um, so Lisa has um, already put my slide deck in there, my PowerPoint in there for you to download if you want to or get access to for the links and everything. So in mod four, okay. So the overview, I mean, at this point, one of the things I'm asking you to do is make sure that your schedule and your um, syllabus have a, a totally dark green gear. Make sure they're 100%. Um, and once you do the first couple of documents, you start learning things so that you don't have to keep running the checkers as often. You might do it at the last minute and say, oh, I want to make sure that we're just saying it's okay. And, you know, when I upload it, you'll get in the habits of using the headings, you know, making sure that you put in text for hyperlinks and make the, the text, the link, things like that. Um, so it hopefully will become second nature once you start doing it. Okay. Um, so we want to make sure that all of our uh, materials are ADA compliant. Um, we're going to um, identify the quality and compliance standards, um, which I talked about through Oscar, and that was part of the PowerPoints. Learn the steps to create compliant materials, and that's some of the readings and stuff that you're going to be doing in this module. Um, identify and use universal design. Okay, Universal design has been around for many years. And you've probably seen the graphic where they show the students standing outside a, um, a school and they have a ramp that's covered in snow and they have stairs covered in snow. And the student that's in the wheelchair is sitting outside waiting for them to clear off the ramp. And that student says, why aren't you clearing off the ramp first? And he goes, well, because you're only one person and we have all these other students that need to get up the stairs. And she points out that if you did the ramp, everybody could go up the ramp, not just me. So um, that's a big part of it. And like I said, the, the things that we do to make our stuff ADA compliant, we're also helping all the students, okay? So we talk about universal design a little bit in this. And then we do have a discussion um, where we're gonna do the key takeaways about compliance and universal design. So as you go down through the module, the first thing I want you to take, just to give an, an idea um, of what you already know about accessibility. I want you to take this self-evaluation, okay? And if you want to, after you get done with the module, you can retake it. You can take it as many times as you want and see if you can improve your scores. Um, I think a lot of people, once they go through it the first time, they realize, oh, I, you know, I didn't realize that, or you know, I need to work on that, or I need to learn more about that, okay? Um, there is a link in here. This link goes out to our blog with the accessibility information with all the recordings of all the sessions that I did back in October. Okay. Um, another thing that I talk about in here and bring up, in, and this is something I've been trying to point out as I've been helping people build their courses, that um, online discussions um, were a terrible barrier 
for not only um, our sight impaired students, but for our students overall. Um, some faculty were not having the discussions up here in the modules where the students were actually going to be using that discussion and participating in it. And the faculty were directing the students to the discussion link in the menu. And um, we had a student two summers ago that um, had a screen reader reading to her and she had a terrible time being sent out to the discussion board because it was showing all the discussions in the course. And she couldn't figure out based on the names of the discussions, which one she was supposed to be doing within that module, okay? So um, it's very important to make sure that if you're gonna have your students participate in the discussion, don't direct them to the discussion board, um, the menu item here, because let me give you an example. If I send my students, if I sent you guys to the discussion board, look at all the discussions that are in this course. This was actually um, a course that was combined with another one. So you can see there's tons of different discussions in here. So it would make it very hard for you to figure out what discussion you should be participating in, depending on what we were doing. So it's very important. So if I go back into Mod 4 again, you see the link with the information to the discussion that we're participating. So when you click on that link, you're ready to start the discussion. You're ready to hit create thread and get started. So that's- Donna, I just want to mention that um, that's an excellent point, but also in the subject field, naming them accordingly is very important. It helps for the grade book and it helps for students to identify if they do happen to stumble on the discussion board, which one they need to go to. You know, in my course, I use D1, D2, D3, colon, but I put a name, like, you know, a name that is kind of the overall theme of whatever the discussion topic is, but um, discussion board, discussion name, or just discussion would not be good enough. You definitely want to name them. Yeah, and it makes it easier for you to figure out um, what discussion you're grading, you know, as you can put up, you can reorganize them and everything. So it's, it's really important, you know, keep all the content that you're working with in that module in the module, okay? So it just makes it easier. They're not going off to different parts of your course to try and figure out what am I supposed to be doing now, okay? She's talking about a discussion, but I don't have a discussion in here. So then they're trying to go off and find that discussion board and try to get into it to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. So creating that link should be right in there. Now, I actually have two videos in here the first video is if you've already created your discussions, but you didn't link them inside of the modules where you want them to actually take place. So that's the first video that I created here. The second video is creating discussions from scratch. And that will actually step you through where you actually go to where you want the discussion to occur and you build it from there. And it will already have the link in the module where you want it to be. So um, I would recommend though, build your instructions for your discussion outside in like in a Word document. And that way it makes it easier for you to copy and paste those instructions in as you're going through the steps. Because discussions require two different locations of instructions and you've got to paste it in there twice. So that way you want to make sure that they see the instructions on the discussion before they go in and then once they go in, they actually have to hit create thread to see the inside direction. So that's why it's, it's important to see them in the module as well. So I have them out here, okay? Um, I do have um, an example of why we are required to make sure our content um, is accessible. And I talk about the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act and what is required to us by um, federal governments. All right, there's a video in here that you're going to watch about universal design. It's a great video. Okay, here's our discussion. And then your two homework assignments. Okay, your first homework assignment is to actually go in and make sure your syllabus and your schedule are ADA compliant. Okay, so if you um, don't have that dark green 100% try to get it to that point using my examples and my um, videos and try to get it to that 100%. Um, a lot of people will get it so that Word says it's 100% and then when they create the PDF and upload it, it says all of a sudden it's 98% PDF. 
And a lot of times you've forgotten to put in that title out in the properties. And that's the one thing that it needs. And um, it's just, it's one of those little sticklers. And it's funny because I let SUNY know about a year ago that I figured that out. So I, they kept saying, oh, Ally couldn't figure it out. It wouldn't tell them why it wasn't 100%. And I was the one to let them know what needed to be updated. Okay. So, um, you know, that's what you're going to do. And what I would like you to do, if you want help from me, you can send me your syllabus and I can tell you what's wrong with it and how to fix it or whatever. Or you can try using the Ally and see what Ally is recommending. If you click on the gear, and I can show you in one of the files if you want, um, if you click on the gear, it tells you what percentage it is. Sometimes if the document is real small and there's just one thing wrong with it and you fix it, that can bring it up to 100%. It just depends on how big the file is and how many errors you have in it, okay? Um, how the percentage shows up, all right? So what I would like you to do is part of the directions, um, I have the video on how to go in and make it, you know, a Word file, ADA compliant. So if you need help with it, I'm giving you the video. Um, I'm not sending you off. There are, you know, I am, there is options to go out and look at this materials, but I'm trying to give you the information right there, right where you're going to be doing it. Um, and a lot of you already have this done. You might have to do a little bit of tweaking. Um, what I would like you to do is a screen capture showing your syllabus and your, and your schedule with that dark green gear on it. And that's what you're submitting for the assignment. Okay. If it's light green, I might come after you and uh, try and help you out so we can get it to 100%. Okay. All right. The last assignment, and I only did two assignments because this one's kind of important. Um, it's doing a narrated PowerPoint. Okay. And one of the reasons why we have it in this chapter is because we actually want you to have a finished project, project done. The video is done. It's it's going to be uploaded either to Ensemble or it's going to be going to um, YouTube. And um, I want to make sure it's closed caption. Okay. I want to make sure that your students see you. They know who you are. Whether you have a picture in your PowerPoint, that's fine. You want them to hear your voice. Okay. Um, I tell this story all the time. I was at a, um, a soccer tournament with one of my sons. And I got up to answer the phone and I walked away. And when I came back, a woman stopped me and she said, do you work for NCCC? And I said, yes. And she goes, do you do the videos on helping people how to use Blackboard? And I'm like, yes. And she goes, I recognized your voice. And so it's, it's that connection to let your students know you're not just a robot. You're a person that's there that's going to help them. So it's really important to make that connection with your voice. And if you have a picture or if you wanna show, you know, a thumbnail of you as you're doing it, um, it makes that connection that we, I think the students really need to know, okay? So for this assignment, I'm giving you an hour and a half to two and a half hours to do whether you already have it done and just have to tweak it or um, need to make a video out of it or whatever. We, we give you a PowerPoint example that you can download. It's right here, okay? Um, you will see that it's a yellow gear, so it's not 100% accessible because I didn't make certain things accessible because you were gonna be replacing the video or the pictures and stuff like that. And I wanna make sure that you know how to go in and do the um, alt text on a picture and stuff, okay? So, and you're gonna be altering it anyway. So a lot of the stuff that I have in there needs to be um, changed anyway. So you're gonna download this file. You're gonna go in you're going to update it. In fact, I can open it up here. What we try to do is give you examples of what you, know, what you should be talking about, what you should be telling them. You know, you're gonna upload your own picture. You're gonna add your information. Um, you know, what student learning outcomes you're using in your course. You know, what kind of activities you're using in your course. So it's, it's just kind of a template for you to go in and fill in and use this to um, narrate your PowerPoint. Now, when you go to create this, I don't care what you use, okay? If you're used to using Zoom and doing recordings, you could share your screen, bring up that PowerPoint and record it using the Zoom, okay? And create a recording that way. If you know or want to learn how to do a narrated PowerPoint, I've given you the videos and the instructions that you can use in this module. So if you wanna learn how to do it, 
PowerPoint has the ability to export as a MP4 file that can be uploaded to Ensemble or out to um, YouTube. Okay. Um, the nice thing about I love about PowerPoint is if you screw up one slide, you can go back and record just that one slide again. You don't have to re-record the whole thing, which is what you would have to do if you use like Screencast-O-Matic or if you use Zoom or use the live recording and ensemble. So um, that's kind of where I directed you a little bit, but I've given you all of the instructions. I've given you how to actually narrate a PowerPoint so you can watch the video on how to do that. Um, I actually gave you the link out to Microsoft with the written instructions. So if you're more of a visual learner where you wanna see the instructions, you can go out to that website and do step-by-step -step instructions to learn how to do it that way, if that's the way you learn. Um, got another tech tool for you to try, and this is one of the videos that Lisa did on using Screencast-O-Matic, and you can record your screen and have a thumbnail of yourself in there if you want to do that, so that's fine. Um, and then I've given you directions on how to upload it to YouTube, so if it's something that you've never done, you can learn how to do that. And I've talked about why we use YouTube. YouTube has the ability to set it up so that um, you can make it private so that only your students would have the link to it from within your course, or you can embed it in the course and they would watch it within the course. So um, it automatically closed captions it. It's free storage for us. We don't have to pay for that storage on our campus like we do through Ensemble, um, through our Zoom. Okay, um, we can make it private. And for those of you that are adjuncts that are teaching at multiple campuses, if you upload something into um, your Zoom account or your Ensemble account, you might not be able to embed that on another campus on one of your other classes. So YouTube, you have it, you have access to it and you can use it anywhere you want. Okay, so that's one of um, you know, the advantages of hosting it on YouTube. And then we have um, how to embed it in Blackboard, okay? So um, I have it set up so that you're sh it shows you how to do that. And I just realized I did not add the assignment to this where you're actually going to um, give us a link to your video once you're all done. So I'll have to make sure I add that. Donna, I, see, I see something in the chat. Um, I, I think Eric is asking, is there a better option than just a thumbnail she really wants? I'm just see here. I'm, I'm. You may have addressed it, but if you use Screencast-O-Matic um, or other tools similar, you have the option to also show your webcam while you're talking. You could do a split, or you could do the whole webcam. I've seen um, some people. Uh, Kim Berger did a nice welcome video that's just straight video of her, um, and then she has the slides for them. Um, you could mix it, so you can do half and half or one or the other. So. Tools like that provide that capability, or you can have one slide that's a larger picture of you. You can choose that um, so you can work with that template or do it in some other way. But also you can, um, you know, we mentioned, I don't know if Donna mentioned as an option. I mean, there's any, any, people use a variety of tools to make these videos. Whatever tool you use is fine. We just make a couple recommendations based on things that we know are simple, but you could definitely choose what you want to use. You can even use Zoom, do a, a screen, there, record in the cloud. If you have a transcript set up, you'll have a transcript with it. So there's lots of options. Um, she just wants to make sure. We just want to make sure you turn in while it's narrated. In compliance. We know how you know how to. Use yeah. Stuff. And Even also, if you wanted to record with your phone. Up. You're you're breaking up. Yeah, later. I've seen that too. It works just fine. Yeah. So there's. I mean, we're giving you something to start with. If you choose not to use this as an example and you just want to do yourself talking as your introduction for your welcome, we don't care. It, you know, it doesn't matter. But like I said, it's that connection that you make with your students. You know, even if you just show a picture of you, it's better than them not knowing who you are. So if they did come to campus and they saw you in the hallways, they would know that you were their instructor. Okay. So it's making that voice and, and visual connection with them to let them know that you are an instructor in their course, 
you're there to help them. Okay. And just realize I do have the assignments. It's the first thing in the, in the section there. So when you go to um, do the assignment, I would like you to provide a link to your video. Okay. Or if you want to just, you know, do a screen capture of where you have it embedded in your course, you can do that. Okay. Um, now, when you do put a video in your course, and I'm not sure if, if this is what Erica was asking about um, the difference between the embedded, the thumbnail, and the link. Okay. I'm not quite sure if that's what she was asking about. Um, I embed my video into Blackboard. Okay. And the reason why I embed it is because if I give them the link to go out to YouTube to watch my video, a lot of times you lose them because you know how it is. You get out to YouTube and all these videos show up on the right hand side of the screen that they're recommending for you of all the cute uh, dancing dogs and, you know, the new Christmas scenes and stuff like that. And we lose our students that way. If we're sending them out there, they might not come back and finish up what they need to do in the course. So I prefer to do that or the embedded one. And this is an embedded one here. Okay. Now, if I do embed it, I often will also give the URL as part of it so that, um, and you have that option when you do a YouTube one. And I think even, I think um, Ensemble only lets you embed. Okay. So it actually creates the video right on the screen there. So um, I, if I was doing it through YouTube, I could give them the link too. So if for some reason it wasn't working inside my course, or let's say Blackboard's down, my students could still go out and watch my video out if they have the link to it. If I send it to their email or something like that, I could still direct them now to watch the video. Okay. Um, I put my video in two different places. I have my welcome video as a link up in my banner at the top of my course when you go into the home page. And I also embed it in my start here section. So if they didn't see it right away at the top, then when they start going through the start here, they can watch it there as well. So because it's important to make sure that I'm giving them, because I tell them how to navigate my course as well through that video. So um, it's very important to make sure that they watch it for me. Okay. So, you know, it all depends. And, you know, you could do a video introduction just talking about yourself, just to introduce you to the course. Okay. You could do, I have a I use screencast o -Matic to go in and I actually um, navigate the course for them to show them what they should be clicking on to get started in my course. Okay. So, I actually have two different things that I use. So, you know, if, if you choose that that's what you want to do, that's fine too. But like I said, it's that connection you're making with your student to get them started, okay? Um, how you do it, whatever tool you use, it's up to you. Like I said, if you don't wanna use the narrated PowerPoints that we're giving you as a template, that's fine too. It's you know totally up to you, but we want some kind of welcome that includes you know your voice, maybe a picture to start with or the audio where it's showing you. Um, if you, I know some people don't like to have them on video, so they would, they would prefer to do the PowerPoint and just show a picture. Okay. So, um, it's totally up to you how you want to do it. Um, but, um, and back to Erica's question, I think the, um, the, the thumbnail, they actually have to click on and it still only goes up to a certain size when you do the thumbnail for them to watch the video. Okay. And like I said, I prefer embed, but you could do the link out to YouTube as well. Okay. All right. So I'm done going through what we're going to be doing in the course. Is there anything um, that I missed in the questions, Lisa, or anybody else that wants to unmute and ask a question or... All right, like I tried to do, I mean, I tried to example this particular module based on what I do for my students. Once I get them in there, I try to give them everything they possibly would need to complete the assignment. So that's why I gave you all the resources and all the help and um, we'll go from that, you know. So hopefully anything that you have a problem with, you'll, you can find it in there. What's up, Maria? Since you're so disappointed that nobody added anything. <laughs> 
I just wanted to say, I, I don't think I'd be able to resist just telling them in that welcome video that the most important thing they should know right off the bat is to go to my grades to look for their grades and feedback because I don't think they, I'm still realizing that they don't know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say it like I'm going to have a hat on, a coffee cup where it's written on there, a t shirt, fire in the back, you know, whatever I have to do to make sure that they know that. So. Yeah, I, I love that idea. My, <laughs> I give my students a video. Dancing um, girls, you know, whatever it takes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Donna, yeah. do we um, do we get Zoom through the college? I mean, I have a Zoom account anyway, but is there a special link or something we'll get to that we're supposed to use for them? If you um, if you are going to do a lot of Zoom sessions with your students, well, every, every I class think you be. are. Yeah. So you would want to reach out to OIT and ask for the pro account because right now you're limited to 40 minutes. No, I have a I have an account that's unlimited. Oh, so, okay. So you do have one already then. Yeah. So I'm wondering, can I just use that or do I need to use something through? Nope. The if you want to if you want to do it through Zoom and record it and use that, that's just provide fine. them the link. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm so glad you asked that because I have different Zooms from different schools and they all have different things. And I'm, I just wish I had one link I could use. You have a personal room, right, Donna? Yes. Yeah. I mean, is that the same thing? Could I just do that and use it everywhere? You could. Yes. Because it's so confusing. I have to make sure the links are all, you know, even though I have one link now that I'm using everywhere, it's through GCC, it's limited. And uh, I, I just would like to have that waiting room. Yeah. So I'll talk to you about that. Okay. Maria, how is it limited? Like what? what do I only mean? get 40 minutes at GCC. Oh, and, and oh you so also it's not a professional account. No. They have different grades of accounts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's just the free. That sounds like the free, free version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and they also, it's limited to 40 minutes. Well, they actually, they said that um, uh, one of the other things is that they, it, it doesn't give you the participant list either. So you have to take attendance. It's because yeah. you're not using the pro account. Yeah. yeah, so I have to fix all that this break. It's not been consistent. Okay. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? I have a quick question. Sure. I have a I have a pro Zoom account through the college right now, but I suspect that post pandemic those pro accounts will go away. So if I were to make materials now, let's say videos for my students would I still be able to access, access them if I make them in Zoom now and I no longer have a pro account, let's say a year from now? I would recommend downloading the files so that you have them because you can download the MP4 files from Zoom just so just in case, you know, anything like that. Because I know that um, a lot of places right now, they're starting to restrict how much you can even hold on there. So, um, yeah, I mean, right now, YouTube is still offering free. You know, if you want to upload it to YouTube to make sure that you have it and don't lose it at this point, um, it, it might, I, that's what I would recommend, or at least download it and put it on your computer. And so that you have those files if, if something were to happen. Thank you. Yeah, you always want copies of everything. You never know what could happen. Your grade book, your course, yeah. you know, recordings, but YouTube does, I put them up there and do them unlisted and I make a channel out of it. So all my students you know, they can access all my videos at any time through that channel. Uh, very easy to do that. Uh, I, I like to Zoom transcript for courses like this because it's fast and I don't have to have a two-step process. But, you know, sometimes if I'm just making a quick screencast, hello, so what we're doing this week, I won't go through all those steps. But if I'm, you know, recording a lecture or something important I want to reuse, I make sure I have copies or I get it loaded in another place just in case. Not a bad idea. I'm sorry to bypass the chat. I'm not looking at that right now, but the, the pro accounts, are those through the schools or can you just get one yourself? I'm sure you have to pay. Does anybody know how much it costs? Because I'm almost willing to do that just to avoid the headache. I think I it's $15 a month or $16 a month. Oh, that's more than that. Yeah, but I, that was what I checked in <laughs> April. I mean, you know, law of supply and demand, it could be more. No, I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions? Okay. All right. If you think of something, let me know. Um, I'm you can going... go ahead. If anyone has a question, you could just use us. Yeah, just unmute yourself. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording for now.